invitation. And um, Lottie, that was amazing. This isn't how I was going to start my talk, but if any of those girls ever expresses the tiniest bit of interest in neuroscience, and I'm very serious, you put me in touch. I will make sure they get graduate education. That sounds impractical. Why would you need a graduate education? It's amazing. Why would you need a graduate education in neuroscience? And I hope that by the time I'm done, maybe you'll be more convinced of its um, utility. So how do we learn? This is what I'm interested in. How do you learn something new? How does your brain change when that happens? And why are there differences in how we learn and how our children learn and the children around us learn? So how can some people learn more quickly and more efficiently than others? Why do we sometimes learn one skill much more effortlessly? Um, I'm a movement person. I'm really good at motor skills. I've been trying to learn French for most of my 50 years on this planet, and I'm an <laughs> abject failure. One of my daughters is in French immersion, has been in French immersion since school started this year, and she has surpassed me. And it's been about five weeks. So what is that? How does that happen? And that's what I'm fascinated with. That's what I actually studied in my lab at UBC, and I'm a neuroscientist and a professor there. And you heard a long list of very um, unintelligible, probably, things that I have behind my name. And I'll try to tell you a little bit more about the other things that I do in my life and how that really cycles back into being a neuroscientist. These are neurons. They're quite beautiful. This is the architecture in our brain. All of us have between three and five trillion neurons or brain cells in our brain. And together, somehow, somehow amazingly, these work together to allow us to do all the elegant things we do, to think and to talk and to learn and to then share that knowledge with our kids. And I like to think of our neurons as being almost like trees. Um, the image here is actually of real neurons. And um, what you can see is that you have these long, slender processes off a rather large cell body. And it's by the interactions across these different processes from neuron to neuron that communication occurs in the brain. And so when we learn, we actually change our neurons. We change them in three very important ways. We can change the chemical transmission between them. It's called neurotransmitter. That's what happens really fast. And this is what relates to short-term memory. So if you remember one thing for maybe just a few hours, but it's lost the next day, this is a short-term memory. Those aren't always encoded into long-term memory, very unfortunately for most of us. And that happens through this chemical process. Our neurons can also change the way that they're structurally organized. So each neuron, I like to think of them as trees. They're, they're these big branches reaching out, and they're touching the neuron next to them. And the architecture of those trees can actually change. And that happens with practice and with learning. So we can increase or decrease the connections between those neurons. And that's the second way that learning takes place in the brain. And then lastly, the brain is a huge thing. I just told you there's, let's say, five. We're all very smart women. So, and actually, women tend to have um, more neurons and more elegant connections between their neurons than men um, in their brains. And so we're probably on the five trillion end of the range. And so for our five trillion neurons, it makes up a rather large brain. And you can have changes in the way one brain region is interacting with another. So the functional connectivity of the brain can change. So what we know about the brain, I'm not even sure where to point. Ah, well, that was exciting, but it went way far ahead. There you go. This is my brain. Um, it's not my, my brain on drugs or steroids or anything crazy. It's actually the, the wiring, the connectivity of my brain and showing you all the different ways that the brain is connecting with other brain regions. And these, this understanding we have about the brain, we have about how the brain's changing with learning, this has come largely from medical research. So I started my career as a physical therapist, and my first interest was in how do people recover from stroke? How do you teach a damaged brain to learn? And in medical research, we've known for a long time that brain reorganization is a major factor in how people recover some of the lost damage, some of the lost function after the brain is indeed damaged. A few years ago, about four to be exact, um, I had Sandra Husel in my office repeatedly at UBC saying, do you think any of your work would apply to education? And I was like, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a stroke researcher. Go away. Leave me alone. I have meetings to go to and, and carpools to drive. And actually, slowly, my attention started to turn to thinking about, well, why don't we think about 
brain change, or what I call neuroplasticity in the context of education, in the context of childhood education. And so we slowly became interested in this and started a number of research projects at UBC. And those are underway now. But I think that the learning that we already have obtained from studying how the brain changes in adults and after it's damaged applies very directly to our children. So our children are these incredible learning machines, firstly. Um, they're able to encode information at a pace which is frankly breathtaking now that I'm an adult looking back at it. Um, children do learn faster than adults, although the good news is you don't ever lose your capacity for neuroplastic change. So this is something you're going to be able to do well into old age. And we really are doing it from what we call in medicine cradle to grave, this changing of our brains. But children are really good at it. They're particularly good at encoding new information and learning new skills. But the problem is they don't necessarily do this at the same rate. Let me do it right this time. Nope. Maybe you have to point that way. That's a box. Any given box? I don't know. I'll just keep talking. Um, so what is interesting about children and about adults as well is that we're learning that people are highly variable in how they change their brain. Now, unfortunately, this absolutely doesn't work with existing medical models for research. So when you're trained as a researcher, you learn that all we really want to do is show statistical significance and publish a high-impact paper so you can advance your career in academics. That's how we're trained. And the way we do that is we collect lots of data, and we average it all together, and we say, aha, this is different. This group is different than that group. And there's a lot of problems inherent in that model, because what we do by collecting a lot of data and averaging it is smoothing out all the individual differences. So there's a quote in research that I love, and it says, you know, by averaging, what we have done is learn something about the average subject, the average participant in that study, but we haven't actually learned anything about any of the individuals who made up that group. And that's what we tend to do in research, and I've also come to realize that that's what we're also doing when we educate our children. Children go to the same school, and they have a set curriculum, and we learn multiplication in the fourth grade. Now, as a neuroscientist, I sit back and I say, is the brain ready in the fourth grade? Is it possible that some children might be better at learning multiplication in the second grade? And others might not be ready till sixth grade. Like, where does that come from? Why do our kids go to school for six hours a day? Is it just so we can have a break? Is there, I mean, that's part of it. But is there something magical about that dose of education? And that's what it is. We're dosing them with practice so their brains can change. So there's a ton of incredibly interesting questions in this field, and we're just starting to unpack them. At UBC, we're just embarking upon um, putting together what will be only the fifth in the world center for educational neuroplasticity. We try to understand these relationships between our children's brains and their unique individual brains and how the educational content that we're delivering them. And really, we have the goal of that, of enabling each child to succeed to their best possible self by structuring their educational intervention. And that's what school is. It's an intervention, just like a medical intervention. By structuring that educational intervention to enable them to be the best that they can be. If I could ever advance the slide, I can't. So maybe it's because I'm walking around. Ah, so there it went. I already told you that. Here's the very most important slide. So I told you I have a whole list of things behind my name. You heard a lot of ones. I'm a professor, and I advise the vice president on health research at UBC. But I do a lot of other things, too. Um, I'm a mom, and these are my twin daughters. Um, I'm a runner. I happen to manage two U12 girls soccer teams. But sketchy ability on that one. Um, and I was just informed that I'm going to be coaching a girls 12 and under basketball team, which is news to me. Um, but I want to share with you that I don't do any of those very well. At least I don't think I do. And I bet that maybe some of us have the same feeling. It is incredibly difficult, I think, as moms to, to do it all, to balance it all. And I'm one of those crazy people who's, who's tried to pretend that I'm doing it all. 
And then I lie in, ba- in bed, you know, exhausted each night and think, okay, I did everything at about 72% of what I should have done it at. And that's a good day. Um, it's incredibly difficult being a woman scientist. This is the most women I've had in any, in any room with me in years. Um, I am often the only woman in a meeting, in a room. I'm the only one on the call saying, did we consider gender equity stats in that? In science, uh, there's a lot of data showing that um, women are harassed. If you think about the academic model, you have a professor and you have a student, and that student is both the employee and the trainee of that professor. The power imbalance is incredible. Um, I decided to have children very late in life because I'd been in school for so darn long, I just couldn't even think of it. And I was actually told by my mentor not to because it would ruin my career. Um, This was someone who I was working for at the time was a postdoctoral fellow. Um, I quit my job and moved elsewhere, just in case you're wondering how I take feedback of that sort. (laughs) But it is. It is very challenging. And in addition to my real passion for understanding the brain, I have a real passion and and sincere hope that my children will encounter less of this than I have. I used to hope that they would encounter none of it. Um, I've become more realistic as I've gotten old and maybe worn down a little bit. Now I'm just hoping for a little bit less. And so I thought I would share with you, and I don't know if this is all helpful, but I have three rules that I adhere to in, in my interactions with my kids with trying to balance my research, the demands of the university, um, trying to advocate for women in science, and my kids, who are incredibly important to me, and probably the most important things. The first thing is, I always put my kids to bed at night. We have a lot of late meetings at UBC and elsewhere. And I say, no, I'm always home if I'm not traveling. And I put them to bed. And that is my job, period. Because sometimes it's the only time of the day I've had a chance to actually sit and talk to them. And they are now 12 almost, so they're in separate rooms. So it takes a really long time. Sometimes I'm actually dozing while they talk. Um, But I I think this is our time to communicate. My second rule is I have to do something for myself every day. I'm a runner, and I run almost every day, six days a week. And the only time I can do that is very first thing in the morning. So you may see I have a Band-Aid on my knee. I fell in the dark earlier this week. It's very dark right now. But I feel that for my own personal sanity, I have to have one thing. And I always think about it, you know, people say when you save, you pay yourself first. So my morning run is I'm paying myself first for that day. For whatever else comes, I'm going to get this one thing in. It might be a short run, but I'm going to get that done. And then lastly, as my kids have gotten older, my third rule is absolute honesty. So if I really have something I have to work on, I'm like, guys, I'm sorry. This is really important. This is why. Do we agree that it's important enough for me to stay at work late or miss the soccer game or take this trip? And they may not agree. And sometimes they don't. They've actually instilled a fine system for me if I work on vacation. If it's $25 in email, it can get quite expensive. (laughs) And so sometimes I sneak it, but I have been caught, and that's not good. But I do feel that it's important that my daughters grow up knowing that it is a challenging world, and it's especially challenging for women, I think. My kids are both very interested in the sciences, so I can feel this coming. They're going to feel my pain. And so I want to be honest with them, and I want them to be honest back with me of, this is really important, Mom. I really need you at this cross-country meeting. Okay, cancel the afternoon. Tell the vice president of research I'm sick. Is this being recorded? (laughs) And get to this, you know, get to the event that is key for for that child. And I found that this actually, as my kids are getting older, it actually works. They have a lot of input. They have a tiny bit of empathy. We're working on that. But that they that this is kind of what helps it all put together. So I hope this is a tiny bit helpful. I hope that all of you recognize that, and I think you do, but we have to give ourselves credit for the hard jobs that we have, that I think 72% on all of those things I'm trying to do is is pretty good. I'm going to take it. I'm going to work for 74 for tomorrow, but it it really may or may not happen. I'm not sure. We don't actually have Halloween costumes yet, so I'm predicting maybe the low 60s. But we're going we're gonna to give it a whirl um, and, and do the best we can. And then the hope of it all is that we're going to make this place a lot better. We're going to hopefully make education a lot more effective for all children. 
And we're going to grow a strong generation of women who can go forward and continue that legacy because it's certainly not going to be able to be accomplished just by us and, and the amount of time that we have and the amount of energy and resources that we have. So um, thank you very much for the invitation.